I <clears throat> messed up my arm uh, four weeks and three days ago. Not that it's on my mind all the time. It, it is on my mind all the time. And um, I did it lifting a table here at the church. And uh, I did it in kind of an awkward way. Um, and I won't be lifting tables in that way anymore. I'm looking forward to being able to lift tables, but not like that. So I've had this on for a while, and uh, I realize that uh, it seriously is constantly on my mind. And it can make it hard for me to do other things that I need to do, other things that I need to think about, because I have a Volkswagen strapped to my arm. It's, so it's, it's a constant reminder and uh, I, it, it can actually, it, it's funny how distracting it really is. I, I do try to use it to my advantage, though, because I'm not a fool. So um, if, you know, we're at the house and unfortunately Julie's going to hear, she's here and she's going to hear this, but she may say, oh, hey, can you help me do this? A one-armed man could help her, but I instantly go, oh, gosh, I'd really like to, but, you know, so I try to use that to my advantage um, I think she's caught on, so I haven't told her anything that she didn't already know. It, it's been my uh, focus, like I said, for a while, and I realized this, too. Uh, I'm deficient with my left arm. So it, it's, it's, it's kind of funny that I've had this attached to me just as long as this, but this arm does not work so well. Like, uh, I, even simple things. Uh, brushing my teeth is actually dangerous with my left hand. I might gag myself. I also use a sonic care. If those of you, you know, it's vibrating really hard. You get that thing on your teeth, I'm pretty sure you could break them. Like, I, I don't know if you've experienced that, but the left hand, I've actually thought, maybe I should be using a regular toothbrush with my left hand. Left hand, it's been here for a long time. It's not so good. Pouring, I've realized, I clean up at virtually after I pour everything. So this is not real hard. You know, I, it looks the same until there's re- liquid involved. And then some way, I miss glasses, I don't stop well, I pour too fast. There's more involved than you realize. <laughs> and it's true. Well, I mention all of this Because our minds can get really focused on something, but a week, a month, a year, whatever time later, that thing that was so consuming and taking up brain space can be a forgotten memory. I'm looking forward to this being a forgotten memory. I'm looking forward to not needing to think so much about how I use my left hand. I've been excited about a whole lot of things over the course of my life. I've been excited about shoes. I'm a shoe guy. Um, I finally did learn. Like when I was young, I was convinced I got a new pair of shoes, and I kind of had this route that I ran around in the front yard to gauge my speed, and I was certain that I ran faster every time I got a new pair of shoes. There was a branch on the tree that I used as a gauge to see if my new shoes helped me jump higher, too. And every time I got a new pair of shoes, I was convinced I jumped higher. Been excited about cars, been excited about uh, vacations, relationships, jobs. The list goes on. Things that I can be excited about. I had a, my second car in high school was a 1968 Firebird. Um, when I got it, it needed an engine, uh, put an engine in it, and then a couple years later rebuilt another engine and, and put it in. Over the course of the time that I had the car, I'd, I'd had it painted. I'd made a whole lot of improvements. But the love for that car was fading. The car wasn't fading. I kept making improvements to it. Like, it actually kept getting better. But my love, my interest for the car was fading. It wasn't as strong as it had been. What is that? How does that happen with us? I've done the same thing with a lot of different things that I've had over the course of my life. 
The, antis- the anticipation of something is awesome. The attainment is great. But then the glory wears off, and I'm not as attracted to whatever that thing that I was so excited about. Can it be that way in our relationship with God? Can it be that we can get really excited at times and then our excitement wanes, our faith kind of gets maybe stale, or it's not even so much that it just gets stale, we just keep living life and, and, and there's so many things that are important in life, it's just hard to keep our faith in its proper place. I do think it can be that way with God. And I think we need to be aware of that and take actions to fight that off. We, if we think because, and this is, I think, important for us to realize, if we think because the original excitement of God wears off, then he must not be worthy of that attention. If if we think that way, we can uh, not operate well in our faith. I think it's important that we think this way. The attention that I or the excitement that I once had for God, it was totally warranted because God is worthy. God is great. God is mighty. Just because we kind of fade or wonder has nothing to do with God. It's us. God hasn't waned. God hasn't fizzled. We need to operate well in our faith, and that takes action, it takes consistency, it takes discipline. Some people are uh, more wired to lose interest in things, including God, than others, but I think all of us have these tendencies. I believe our functioning in this way comes from our sinful nature, that as a result of our sinful nature, it causes us to always want more, to think we deserve more, to lose interest in what is very good and not be satisfied with the wonderful things that God has provided around us. We can even lose an appreciation for how God works, loves, and provides for us. We are starting a new series on the book of Hebrews. We're going to be looking in the first chapter. So if you have a Bible and want to open up to Hebrews, we will get there. There is a lot of good, really valuable stuff that we're going to be talking about over the course of this series. I love the book of Hebrews. I love that it is an encouragement. It's an exhortation for us to live faithful lives to Christ. And we need that encouragement. We actually need that encouragement more than we get it. As I read and studied in chapter 1 in preparation, I was reminded at how the wonder and intrigue of material things and God can fade away. The wonder and intrigue of all kinds of things in our lives, including God, can fade away How does God want us to counter this phenomenon? How does God want us functioning? It's important that we understand we operate that way. How do we counter it? Is there anything we can do? I think there is. The writer of the book of Hebrews, there's a little bit of disagreement about who wrote the book. Uh, Scholars used to think that the Apostle Paul wrote the book, and then over the course of time, many believe now that it wasn't Paul. They can make arguments for possibly other writers. I'm going to tell you this. The most important thing is that the real author is God, who used whoever the human was to communicate exactly what God wanted, whether it was Paul or some other individual. Many New Testament letters written to the church started with a greeting. They were, they were meant to be read to the church, and usually there was a greeting that would be read to begin with, and then they would jump into what God had. Well, the book of Hebrews doesn't 
do that. It jumps right to the main point, which is understanding who Jesus is. This is really God's doing, not the writer's. We are fortunate to be able to hear from God this morning, hear from his word. This is an awesome privilege, and we should not take it lightly. So in preparation, would you guys stand with me as I'm going to pray, and then we'll read Hebrews 1, 1 through 6. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and God, we thank you for who you are. Father, as we were singing many of those truths uh, we're just welling up in me, and I'm sure others, as we, we get to rejoice in who you are. You are great. You are mighty. You are loving. You are forgiving. You are just. Father, we thank you for who you are. And I pray that as we take a look at your word this morning, Lord, that we won't just read it with our eyeballs or hear it with our ears, Lord, but that we will be mindful of what we read, and let it impact who we are, impact our souls. We thank you for the privilege of being here today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hebrews 1, 1 through 6 says this, In the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. He, after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. This is God's word. You may be seated. There's much here that It tells us, but the focus, of course, is on Jesus. And we really only have time to touch on some high points and move on. But I I trust that God's word will speak loudly to you this morning. Verses 1 and 2 right away teach very loudly and plainly that God is not silent. God is not silent. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. Really important for us to get this because if you are like me, sometimes you can wish you would get a special word from God. Like, God, just help me. As a child, I remember many times in my room alone, like asking God to speak to me. I I wanted to know that he was real. I wanted him to give me something, give me information, help me through the day, whatever it was. And when he didn't do that, I could think God was silent. God didn't speak to me the way I wanted him to. The truth is, in these first two verses, God speaks loudly and clearly. He has spoken through his prophets, he speaks through uh, his word, and he has spoken loudly through the coming of Jesus into the world. God used the prophets to communicate God's word, communicate his thoughts, communicate his qualities, and his different actions with his people. The prophets, the writers of the scriptures, could not do this on their own. But they did this under the Spirit's special direction. The prophets were able to communicate God's word as God directed. We can see here in 2 Peter 1.21, it says, For prophecy never, never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the, by the Holy Spirit. The, the prophet isn't writing his own thoughts. 
as godly as they might be, the prophet is writing exactly what God intended to communicate. This passage that we're looking at in Hebrews focus, focuses specifically on Jesus and says that the prophets in the Old Testament had been telling about the coming of Jesus, the Messiah, for years. There's approximately 450, you'll hear scholars say different things, anywhere from four to 500 prophecies in the Old Testament about the coming Messiah. One of my favorites, just want to take a quick look here at, in Isaiah 53. It says so much, written approximately 700 years before Christ. Listen to what Isaiah 53, 1 through 6 tells us. It says, Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a dry root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces as he was despised, and, he esteemed, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Pretty amazing how Jesus fulfilled that prophecy written about him 700 years prior. The word from God is not different from the Old Testament to the New Testament, but it becomes more complete and understood in the New Testament because the primary focus of the Old Testament comes to the world in the form of Jesus. When Jesus came, he brought the very word of God. Because he is the very word of God. John 1, 1 through 5 tells us this. In the beginning was the word, talking about Jesus, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He, talking about Jesus, was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. The prophets were used by God, but Jesus is superior to all of the prophets that preceded him because he is God. It tells us that Jesus was a creator and sustainer of all things by his powerful word. That one that ability and quality of God, Jesus, the Son, always captures my attention. Because you and I in here, we are going to, by God's grace, make it through this service. <laughs> We're going to make it physically through the service because God is enabling our bodies to stay together. It's not because the planet is spinning around at the right speed by chance that we're going to stay together. It's by God's sustaining power that the planet is spinning the right speed and our bodies do stay together. Jesus is the creator and sustainer of all by his powerful word. goes on to tell us that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of of his being. That when people were interacting with Jesus, it was their, they were interacting with God. Jesus said to one of the disciples, I think it was Philip, Don't you know me? I've been among, among you such a long time. When you see me, you see God the Father. Jesus said that. You can bet that had to be mind blowing for people hearing that. Jesus is the 
radiance of God's glory, not just a reflection, the exact representation of God's being, not like you and I. You and I at our very best, we're created in God's image, and at our very best, we might represent God really well at times. But Jesus treated people and behaved exactly as God would, since he was God. Then it tells us this, that creation didn't just happen, and then Jesus stepped back and took a a, a kind of a hands-off approach. Every once in a while, you'll hear people say those kind of things. Uh, They'll say things like, well, I, I don't have a problem believing God created, but obviously he's not real involved in what's going on here because, look, the world is a mess. And there's a misunderstanding there. Jesus is holding all things together so that we and the whole universe continue to exist. He hasn't taken a hands-off approach. Sin is our problem. Sin has created issues. Jesus is sustaining all things. And all things will be made right. Why the whole comparison to angels? You and I, we might hear that and seem might seem kind of strange to us. The thought is that it was probably a response to thoughts and perceptions that people had of angels at this time. They were likely elevating the status of angels and their value. We might do the same things today in various ways. I had somebody that was talking to me about waking up in their bedroom and they had, they called them orbs in their bedroom, kind of bouncing around in their room. I call them headlights. And in in our bedroom, we'll have lights bounce around, but they really are headlights. I don't know what was bouncing around in this person's room, but they called them orbs, and they thought that they were probably communications from their dead father. That can be distracting. Uh... I know it's not an uncommon thing for people who have loved ones pass to hope that that loved one's going to give them some messages, maybe assurances of heaven, maybe tell them something about God, maybe give them uh, wisdom about how to live life. I don't believe those things happen. Jesus is above all of the angels Jesus is above all of the spirits. Our attention needs to be on Jesus, not distracted by other spiritual things. Jesus is identified as the Son of God. Angels are wonderful, but they are created beings who are certainly inferior to the Father, to the Son, and to the Spirit. Only Jesus has the name Son of God. Therefore, He is superior to all, the Son of God. He provided purifications for sin. Passage of Scripture tells us that he provided the purification for sin, which stands to reason since he was the creator. It was only fitting that he would be the one to be the sacrifice that satisfied God's sense of justice For mankind's sinfulness, the creator became the sacrifice to please God so that we sinners could be made acceptable in his eyes, forgiven. We're forgiven because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. As believers, we don't want to let this get stale or blasé. The creator of the world came and suffered to enable believers to be made right in God's eyes. It's interesting, in Romans 7, 24 and 25, Paul does say this. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God The answer is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen. 
If you have not come to a point of faith in Jesus, I encourage you to really consider what the scriptures are telling us about Jesus. We are not able to make ourselves acceptable to God on our own. Jesus came to the world to die for our benefit so that we could be credited with the perfect life that he lived. Through thinking about and meditating on Scripture and the greatness of God, it helps us to not forget and wander away. We have to guard our minds in the midst of a world that is full of distractions, that pull for our attention because our minds will wander and veer from the values that we say we hold. We can say that we want to walk closely with God and that we want to experience the blessings of knowing him. But are we doing what we need to be doing in a consistent manner to enable that to happen? We can say we have priorities and values, but do they show up in our everyday lives? Our real values are represented in what is shown in our lives, not by what we say or even what we tell ourselves. Our real values show up in how we live. We all need to take a look at ourselves and perhaps make adjustments to better keep Jesus in his proper place within our priorities because he is worthy. Now here's the deal. I talked about my right arm and I, I hope I can pull together a good illustration here. My left arm's been on my body for a long time and I have not realized, I have not actuated, I haven't, I, I, I haven't used it to its full capabilities. My right arm gets most of the use. I am dedicating myself, by the way. After I can use this the way I want to, I'm going to do more with my left arm. It deserves some attention, okay? I want to be a little better with it. God gave it to me. Now, get this. Just like we don't utilize our weak arm as well as we could, is there a chance we don't utilize the faith that we have as well as we could? Is there a chance we are maybe just as inept at times in our faith as we are with our left arm or our weak arm? You and I need to take this passage and really work through it in our brains. For the last 13 days, this passage has been what I focused on in preparation. I've done that several times a day, and it's been very beneficial to me. You may think, well, I'd like for my spiritual life to be different. You want to be more connected to, to God. You want to pray more and hear from God as you read the Bible. I want to encourage you, take the steps to do that. Set aside time. This is something you might hear about in terms of a lot of different things that we need to set aside time for in our lives. But it's even more true in our spiritual lives. You have to set aside time. If you don't, you know as well as I do that you will fill the time. Different things will take your mind's time. You will be busy doing all kinds of things. If you don't set aside the time, you probably won't be taking the time that you want to spiritually to feed yourself. If you take that time, it will help align your values and your life in many, many ways. I can assure you that your efforts to focus on Jesus will pay off and you will be blessed by drawing close to God. Hebrews 1, 1 through 6, is a wonderful focus on Jesus. We need to focus our lives on who Jesus is and allow him to impact our lives daily. Would you close with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters here. Father God, we're all in the same boat. 
this boat of life. And sometimes we uh, can get on a journey and kind of out of control with where it's taking us. Lord, we want to do a better job of taking control of the journeys of our lives as we focus in on who your word says Jesus is. The Son of God, the sustainer of all things, the one who made purification for our sins so that we could be forgiven. Father God, we thank you for how you love us, how you pursue us, how you are not silent, but you are loud. Father, give us the ears to hear and the minds to see you better so that we can be the people you want us to be. Father, we thank you that we can come together to gather, gather and worship and do that now. In Jesus' name I pray.